to Good evening, brothers and sisters. We are happy to welcome all of us to the Emmanuel Methodist Church. We ask that we all make ourselves comfortable and in an expectant mood for what we are about to receive through this interaction. And so we want to again welcome everybody warmly to the Emmanuel Methodist Church, Airport East Circuit. Trust us when we say that this is the warmest church in the whole of West Africa. Uh, begin to feel the warmth. It is important to highlight that the person in whose name we are given this was an important anchor of this warmth that we speak about. So indeed, we want to, you to relax and enjoy the company that you have here. Just um, one or two housekeeping um, support for our washroom. Uh, if at any point where you need to use a washroom, um, on my right, which is on your left when you get out, please um, move to your left side when you are walking to my right behind the, uh, where I'm speaking and you will see the male and female um, male and female washrooms on your left and on your right. So please do kindly uh, make yourself comfortable um, when need be. We want to start with the devotion and we would request and humbly invite Reverend we want to invite Fifi, Reverend Fifi Afeni to lead us with a devotion. Thank you. So you are warmly welcome to Emmanuel Methodist Church, East Airport. And here our greeting is Emmanuel and respond, God with us. Or in the local language, Yaminiyewo, Emmanuel. So we want to begin in the name of God alone, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing from the Methodist hymn, numbered 80. Thee will I praise with all my heart, and tell mankind how good thou art. How marvelous thy works of grace. Thy name I will in songs record, and joy and glory in my Lord, extolled above all thanks and praise. Thee will I praise with all my heart, and tell mankind how good thou art, how marvelous thy works of grace. Thy name I will in songs record, and joy and glory, my Lord, has stood above all thanks and praise. The Lord will save his people here in times of need. Their help is near to all by sin and hell oppressed. And they that know thy name will trust in thee who to thy promise just has never left us so. This 
In the words of Charles Wesley, the Lord is by his judgment known. He helps his poor afflicted one. He sorrows all he bears in mind. The mourner shall not always weep. Who sows in tears in joy shall reap. With grief, who seeks with joy shall find the last stanza. Helpless soul that looks to thee is sure at last thy face to see and all thy goodness to partake. The sinner who for thee that grief and longs and labors to believe thou never, never wilt forsake. Beloved, let us sit and let us pray. This evening, we want to give thanks and praise to the Lord God Almighty for his goodness, for his mercies. And in brief, so young faster than for me, Razi, when I do no more, I didn't you know, Chow and Abra, but you do. As we give thanks, we also want to thank God for this precious gift in the person of Brother Professor DeGraff Johnson. a patriarch of this society for his various contributions, influences on our lives. Let us give thanks to God. Yeah, Whenever we come into the presence of God, we are afforded the opportunity to confess our sins. And as a hymnist rightly said, that no condemnation now we dread. Boldly we approach this eternal throne. So let us come before him with our sins. Let us come naked, coming to him for dress. Helpless, looking to him for grace. Let us continue to pray. Let us commit this evening's activity into the hands of the Lord. We are invoking the presence of God, the Spirit, in our midst this evening. Now, the word we will do here today will be spirit filled and spirit led. Let us commit anybody here who will perform a role to make this function effective and efficient. Let us bring such people into the hands of the Lord. Let us pray for our speaker, our chairpersons, our guests of honor. Let us bring all such personalities before God this evening. That they would decrease and God would increase in them.
Final, let us pray, committing those who are also on their way here into the hands of the Lord, that God would be with them. Even those who have forgotten, may God remind them of this historic occasion. Now together, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. To end our devotion, we sing the Methodist hymn numbered 585. Rise up, O man of God, have done with lesser things, give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Let's use the other tune. <laughs> Rise up, O man of God. More common. <laughs> Rise up, O man of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and mouth and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O man of God, his kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of Rome. Rise up, O man of God, the church for you that wait has spread an equal to her tax. Rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet have trod, as brothers of the Son of Man. Rise up, O men of God. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet have trod, as brothers of the Son of Man. Rise up, O men of God. Please let us sit. Thank you very much, Asofu, for setting the spiritual tone of this very important event. Brothers and sisters, we would now invite, we need to know the purpose why we are all here. And to do that, we would invite now the diocesan chairman in the name of Brother Kwame Namwesiando to give us the purpose of gathering. Shall we please welcome him? Emmanuel. I don't want to say for Christ because uh, we were expecting the church to be full. I know they are on the way coming. Emmanuel. Okay. Uh, we are gathered here this evening for a special purpose. When I read 
the tribute night that we prepare for Prof. It's wonderful. All the organizations in the church call him special name. Prof is a pillar in this church. This sentence was used by about three of them. I have six of them in this tribute. But the men's fellowship, after writing everything, they summarize it to say that he's a, a founder, one of the founders of this church, and also a founder of the men's fellowship and the founding chairman of the men's fellowship. So when he passed on, the executives of the circuit met and decided that this great Peter, we need to remember him. And what they have, they submitted to the, the diocese for us to accept was that they want to remember him with a series of annual lectures. So we are here today for the first annual lecture in honor of Prof. Professor DeGraff Johnson. That's why we are here. So I think the details will come from the speaker. So we leave it with the speaker and the rest so that they do justice to the topics. But we are here with two very important personalities in the church, in the diocese. The chairman for the occasion, Okay, I want to welcome the chairman of the occasion. He will be especially introduced. They say my function is to just welcome him. Chairman, I welcome the chairman in the person of Right Reverend Kofi Osabuti. Right Reverend, yesterday I was at uh, Trinity in Medina. The church we all built. It has become a very beautiful church. And I was very proud of what we did. Thank you so much. <laughs> our next personality is our fa the father of the diocese. But in this function, he's the guest of honor. He will be officially introduced. But understand, I should welcome him. Right Reverend M.Y. Right Reverend Bishop M.Y. Do we, do we add the two? No. Right Reverend M.Y. Joseph M.Y. Edison. He is our guest of honor. At the appropriate time, there will be detailed introduced. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Brother, the assistant chairman. Uh, we call him Anka Kwamina. Bishop Se, again, we welcome you. We are happy that you are here with us and we are grateful for joining us. Brothers and sisters, we now know the purpose why we are here and a very important one as such. At this point, we would want to introduce the chairman for the occasion. And to do that, we will invite our secretary for the circuit, the airport circuit of the Methodist Men's Fellowship, our brother Fred Asari, to do that. Shall we please welcome him? Thank you very much. Bishop, sir, immediate past Bishop of Accra Diocese, the Diocese and Chairman of Northern Accra Diocese Men's Fellowship, family of the late Professor Degraff Johnson, all ministers present, brothers and sisters, 
I'm grateful to be called upon to introduce the chairman for today's function. Our chairman for today is an ordained minister of the Methodist Church. He was commissioned in 1985 and ordained in 1988. He has been a second minister, a superintendent minister, diocesan youth organizer. He has been a director for the lay ministry. Our chairman has been a senior secretary twice in the Methodist Church in Accra and Sumanya. He has served on several coordinating offices and committees in the Methodist Church. He is a contributing writer and editor of the weekly Bible lesson of the Methodist Church. His key interest area in ministry is on youth development, leadership development, and effective Bible study, on which he has published a number of books for these key interest areas. He is the immediate past Bishop of Accra Diocese, and currently the Superintendent Minister of Joel II. Aside from the ministerial activities of our chairman, on the social side, he has been an assemblyman before. He's an advocate of girl child education. He's a model educator for the NCC during citizenship week. He is currently the Peace Council Chairman for Greater Accra Region, uh, currently serving his second term in office. Our Chairman is married to Evangelist Mrs. Gladys Osabuti with a club offering. Can you help me invite our Chairman, <laughs> Right Reverend Samuel Kofi Osabuti. At this point, we would like to invite, invite our special guest, Father of the Diocese, Bishop Sir, kindly join our chairman at the high table. Also invite the Northern Accra Diocese and Men's Fellowship Chairman to also join the high table. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Fred. I think it would be appropriate now to take the chairman's remark and then on that basis proceed to introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, since I'm used to doing things informal, but I realize that my bishop is here, so I have to behave properly. <laughs> so let me go straight to the formal part of what I have written here. The Bishop of the Northern Accra Diocese, the Superintendent Minister and Ministers of the Airport East Circuit, the leadership and members of the Airport East Men's Fellowship, the Speaker, the family of Professor De Grab Johnson, distinguished invited guests, the people called Methodists, and all gathered here, 
We thank God for enabling us to be with you this evening. We are grateful also to the organizers for considering us worthy to chair this first lecture in honor of an illustrious son of Ghana and a committed member of the Methodist Church Ghana. This being men's week across the collection, we at the Jowulu Circuit have planned a week-long program which ends on Sunday, the 22nd May, 2033. We, in collaboration with the Men's Fellowship, who are the organizers of the Men's Week, have invited Right Reverend Professor Safu Kantaka, past Bishop of Kumasi Diocese, to be our guest speaker under the permission of our Bishop. We are really enjoying some solid teachings on world creation from the Christian perspective. You will understand that we should therefore be supporting him and the men this evening too at Jolo. But here we find ourselves. The consistent persuasion of Brother Cesar Johnson, who we met for the first time at the fifth annual synod of the Northern Accra Diocese at Adenta, and the encouragement we had from our bishop broke our edge to initially not accept to come to chair, knowing that we would be missing a lot of things at Bethany. But our greatest motivation to be here stems from the numerous friends we are always delighted to meet at airport. And those of you who think you are my friends, please lift up your hands, let me see. Aha, uh -huh, good. So I love to come and see my friends. Uh, and that is even the better motivation. And the person whose name this lecture is being held, as well as the speaker. Bishop, sir. We worked with Professor DeGraff Johnson on the committee set up by conference to flesh up the establishment of the Methodist University under the tenure of the late Most Reverend Dr. Samuel Asante Entry. And maybe even they didn't know that part of him. These were the people who initially, uh, because he was then chairman of the tertiary education uh, committee at that time. Papa Sam Abbey and us became acquainted from his days at Calvary through to Emmanuel Society, first as a leader of the church and second as a civil engineer who served creditably as a public servant with Christian conviction. I wrote this before I met him again in the best way this evening, Bishop, and what I wrote is true. Because I started asking him questions about why we have a lot of traffic on the highway. And this evening, just this evening, he has educated me. So if for nothing at all, my education has started before you. <laughs> he just gave me a civil uh, engineering lesson in the adversary for three minutes, telling me how the road should have been engineered. Everywhere we have been, we know that Papa has been part of it. We know he comes to this lecture not as a theorist, but as a practical Christian who understands his team very well. Everywhere we have served in the church, we have consistently been teaching that when the men's fellowship in particular, and the men in general, become alive to their responsibilities, the roles in the faith, and their roles in the faith community, that is the church, it will result in a stronger congregation. As we accept, Bishop Sir, to chair this event, we want you to support us and with us listen attentively to what we all can gain from this lecture. Once again, thank you for accepting me to chair this function. For Christ, we live. for Christ, we live. for Christ, we live. I will serve. The I will serve. The I will serve. We don't want to serve. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for the occasion, for setting us up nicely um, to get into, as somebody says, the, the meat of the matter. So, sir, I think at this point we would... Uh, Uh, I cannot introduce uh, my papa 
sitting down. Friends, I've been giving another tax this evening, Bishop, to introduce our speaker for this evening. In fact, he was born not too long ago, on 21st January 1940, just a few years ago. 1940 is not too far because some people were born in 1840. So, 1940 is just a few years ago. He had his education at Winnebar Methodist School from 1946 to 1954, in Fancy Prime School from 1955 to 1959, 1960 to 1961, KNUST, January 1962 to January 1965, where he graduated in BSc in civil engineering and University of Illinois, September 1968 to September 1970, where he obtained his MS in highways and transportation. So he himself is a highway, you know, it's, it's no wonder. His work experience, he started in June 1965, 1965 at the GNCC. How many of you know GNCC? He will explain it to you. <laughs> uh, through PWD, then Ghana Highway Authority. Finally, Chief Director, S September 1993 to December 2000. I believe that this is the place where he really carved a name for himself. The Ministry of Roads and Highway, Ministry of Roads and Transport. Various constituency appointments after retirement from the public service. His involvement in the church. Our speaker has been involved in the Methodist Church since 1971, when he was first appointed a leader at Bethel Methodist Society, Takradi. He then moved to Calvary Methodist Church at Abraka in 1975, continuing as a leader. Bishop Sir, our speaker has organized the Methodist Youth Service which some of us are now witnessing for the first time. He led the airport Bible class to form the Emmanuel Society. He's been one of the leaders running the orientation class at Emmanuel Methodist Society. He has taught infancy. Please, the thing is infancy, not fancy. As I realized that many of us who were ordering for the weekly Bible lesson had put their fancy. Which is infantile, my boy. They say they are, we don't have weekly Bible selection called Fanti. Why are you? Kasani, you are Not Fanti. And see, a lot of the circuits, and if they are here, we are trying to use this occasion to correct it. The weekly Bible lesson is infantile, not Fanti. And some people, some of the guys who were also others get Fanti. <laughs> The correct one, Bishop, is that is what? Infancy. And our speaker has been teaching the language in this society. Has been the chairman of the Emmanuel Methodist Society Building Committee. He simply wants to be known by his hobby as a horticulturist. And I'm sure one of the appointments you may like to give him is a gardener of the, of the <laughs> Emmanuel Society. What he has asked to be said of him, Bishop, I want to be spiritually and uh, ecclesiastically obedient. I will not go beyond what he has put down for himself. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we rise and welcome Papa Abi Sam. Thank you, Bishop, sir. And see, whilst our speaker takes it easy under the, the divine instruction of uh, Bishop, <laughs> we would sing him 8 
to start before the talk, uh, he begins the talk. Him age to one. Thank you very much. Um, I write Reverend Samuel Kofi Osabote, our chairman, and the right Reverend Joseph M. Y. Edusa Eisen, our great bishop. So for Fifi Afei Donko. Our diocese and chairman, and the famous and great the Graf Johnson family. I'm honored to be called this evening to present this first memorial lecture. And since I got this message, I've been crumbled. I am humbled before all of you because it's a task which for some of us, it seems beyond us. But we are praying that the Almighty God himself will lead us to discuss issues which will build us up and move us forward. Now, Professor Kwao Esibua de Graf Johnson, the seventh of eight children, was born in Accra on 24th February, 1927. His father, John Coleman de Graf Johnson, was the Assistant Secretary for Native Affairs in the Gold Coast. 
a staunch Methodist and a lay preacher. The mother, Mrs. Hannah Day Day de Graf Johnson, was one of the big six of the Methodist Women's Fellowship and the first indigenous officer before the autonomy of the Methodist Church, Ghana. These people were great with all standards. But the prof did not bask in their greatness. He gradually achieved his own greatness with the foundation that the parents gave him. And steadily, he built up a story for himself which led the man's fellowship to decide at his funeral that this function will be held in honor of the work of Prof. For two reasons. First of all, to say, are you cool for the great things that he did? And secondly, for this to serve as a source of inspiration for current and future generations so that we may even be able to do greater things than Prof did. So this lecture was instituted. We will reflect a little bit on his family life and then we will look at a few Bible passages which we think will encourage us in the task ahead. Now, Prof was educated at the government boys' school at Kimbo and of Accra, then the Fanspim school at Cape Coast. Now, he was so brilliant that he was just gathering the prizes. Now, he tells of himself that the father's expectation of him was so great that he had to be careful. But he loved table tennis. So he spent time to play table tennis and all those things and yet be excellent in class. And therefore, he was getting the prizes. After Mfansipim, he worked for about two to three years as a law clerk. And then finally entered Legon to take sociology. He passed out in 1955 with a first class BA honors in sociology. And immediately followed with the master's program, passing out in 1957. Prof loved education. And he sought for excellence at all times. This was translated or transferred to his children, nephews and nieces, his students, and finally to his people, the home helps, those who helped him at home. He believed that even they should receive education to lift them up from whatever position they found themselves in. So he loved education that much. And he ensured that everybody given the opportunity will really make it and seek for excellence. Prof started as a lecturer at Legon in sociology, ultimately becoming the head of department. And after working all over the world, he came back when there was shortage of lecturers from 1991 to 1995, he was persuaded and he agreed to continue to supervise masters and doctorate students so that they will carry out their course. Prof's academic work was not limited to Ghana. At several conferences in Africa and several other countries, United Kingdom, United States, Switzerland, Peru, India, and Germany, Prof said he was an external examiner for several universities because of the caliber of person that he was. 
He was involved in several activities. Population binomials, the establishment of the Institute of Statistics and Social and Economic Research at Legon, the Planned Parenthood Association of Ghana, and he served as the first or the pioneer handler or handling the program of Talking Point. If you remember those days, Talking Point, interesting ideas. He even went into farming and encouraged farming, planting of sugarcane for the Commander Factory. In the international circles, he served as a consultant to the World Council of Churches and to the United Nations Economic Commission of Africa. Prof was an ardent Methodist. And for that reason, the Methodist Church made him their representative in the Christian Council of Ghana. And there he was the chairman of the Programs and Advisory Committee. And then a board member of the Economical, uh, economical sorry, the Fund ECLOF, you usually call it, those who give the fund for various programs. In the local scene, he said at Calvary for a long time. Even though he was working at Legon, he drove all the way to Calvary, and he was one of the most active members of the society. Then when we started Emmanuel, he moved. And in the Bible class, his dynamism, his strength, and his proposal and ideas, which pushed us ultimately to become a society, could not be imagined. He was a great and a strong man. So as the class expanded and we became four leaders, he was one of the pioneer leaders who served with such dedication. His knowledge of the Bible, his knowledge of Methodist principles and Methodist uh, teachers. John Wesley message. All these were great things that Prof did. But if I said this, and I didn't pick some particular things that people said about him, we would be lost. So I want to repeat a few things that people said about him. First, his own children. They say that Prof believed strongly in good upbringing but he achieved discipline without the rod. His eye was strong enough to put you in tune. He had an extraordinary affection for his children, never discriminating, and stretched this affection to friends, nephews, nieces, in-laws, and all. He was freely independent and never saw a barrier to anything he sought to do. He was always cheerful, always optimistic, always seeing a positive side to the things that he would do. And no challenge was too great for him. He would face the challenge and adapt a way out. He would face the challenge and adapt their way out. He never accepted that age was a hindrance or a barrier to his life. He simply violated traditional, conventional medical advice and lived on to 95. That is what the children said about him. And it is true, we all saw it. We all saw it. This could only have happened by the grace of God. Without the grace of God, you cannot go through all these and survive. What do the grandchildren say? The grandchildren say that Prof 
loved God and God's creation. So he devoted his life learning and understanding God's creation. With this childlike curiosity, he engaged them in discussions for them to understand God's creation and the wonderful things God has done for us. They say that grandpa was, had the memory of an elephant. He won't forget things. And in spite of that, he respected other people. And he considered the ideas of other people in humility. Now, the other thing they enjoyed about him was that he was a friend with whom they could enjoy various snacks. He kept snacks in his study, and these grandchildren were enjoying that. So they wrote that about him. Their in-laws loved his frequent counsel, which they held in high regard. He encouraged them to achieve their goals. He believed in building and ensuring a strong family bond. Nana was selfless and kind and always putting others before himself. He taught them to be responsible, hardworking, ethical, and loving. Finally, they observed that Nana loved God and his love for God was seen more in action than in words. At Emmanuel Society, Nana is celebrated as an instrument of God's selfless service and dedication to this society and the circuit as a whole. He contributed substantially to the spiritual and physical growth of the society. Maybe that's why they picked this theme, where the men are supposed to encourage and ensure spiritual and physical growth. He was wonderful in the Bible class, which I have already mentioned, and his knowledge of John Wesley and doctrines of the Methodist Church were wonderful. In the men's fellowship, the men's fellowship held their first chairman in a very high esteem. He devoted all his resources, human, financial, intellectual, and time to the benefit of the fellowship. He was a teacher and a mentor who avoided spoon feeding and will ensure that everybody is taught to fish for himself and not spoon fed. He remained dedicated. And even at old age, you could see him climbing the steps to our meeting room upstairs. He would come every Monday and he was punctual. In the evening, that is punctual because he's an evening man. He's not an early morning man. And he set a wonderful example, contributing good ideas. And for that reason, for the two anniversaries that we had, the 10th and the 20th, Nana was adequately honored. He was a patron to all the other organizations. And the key thing is he liked guiding them to improve in their performance, especially the choir. So you would praise them when praise was due, but if you did something that was not very good, you will find a nice way of actively criticizing so that you will improve. He didn't criticize to destroy. He criticized for improvement. Now, if you summarize the life of Professor DeGrab Johnson, we will put these in the following points. He was a man who was committed and dedicated to service. Committed and dedicated to service. He was a great teacher 
and he sets himself up as a mentor so that others could learn from him. He was a source of inspiration and encouragement to individuals and to groups. One, full of compassion, giving freely for the well-being of individuals and for groups. He lived a life of humility. These attributes give us a challenge on what to do. And as we come to this evening's program, we are going to look at a few Bible passages which should encourage us to be able to carry out the task that is ahead of us. The first we want to look at is the call. If we must form the bedrock for ensuring that this church grows, then we must listen to and respond to the call of God. So we are going to look at a few passages from the Bible which will encourage us to respond to such a call. The first one is Moses. In Exodus chapter 3, 1 to 12, Moses had run away from Egypt. He had been trained as a prince. But he, when he saw injustice, he could not stand. And he tried to solve the problem his own way. And ultimately, that did not go well with him, both with the Egyptians and his Israelites. So he ran away and ended up with Jethro, the Midianite, and married one of the children. So his work mainly was to look after the sheep. Now one day as he was looking after the sheep, Moses saw the bush aflame. But I don't know. If you put a match to this paper and it is aflame and it is not burning, you wonder what is happening. So Moses saw the bush aflame but not burning. And he moved towards it to find out what is happening. And that was when God called him. We are not telling the whole story, but we, I want to quote what God told him. God told Moses, now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt to go back and face Pharaoh. The man wants to kill me already. How can I go back? Even my people don't want to see me. So Moses replied, Who am I? Who am I? to go and carry out this great task. So God told him that he will be with him. He will be the source of his strength. And more than that, he said, your brother Aaron will help you be a spokesman. Apart from that, he gave him power to do miracles so that out of that, the people of Israel could be brought out. And after a series of events, finally, they were allowed to go out. And as they moved, Pharaoh looked at it and changed his mind. What have I done? Allowing these people to go, all the service they were rendering for us, no way. So he formed an army to chase them. And as this army chased them, they came to the sea and they couldn't go. The sea before them, the army behind them. What do we do? The beauty of Moses, that he was a man of prayer. 
So as the people were quarreling and saying, why did you bring us here to kill us? He cried to the Lord. And God listened to him. And he said, point your rod at the sea. And they walked through the sea. Now, we learn four things about Moses. One, that in spite of his initial feeling of inadequacy, he responded positively to God's call. He had a complaint, but he accepted and worked positively. God equipped him. We do not move by our own strength. Unless God empowers us, there's nothing we can do. So Moses was empowered by God for the task. So if we are to mobilize, to form the bedrock, then we need the empowerment of our God and the equipping of our God. Throughout the journey, when he faced any difficulty, he will go into prayer. He will cry to the Lord. And throughout, Moses executed his assignment. Sometimes they made him angry, but he did it with dedication. So this evening, if we are going to be called, then the thing is, are you accepting it? And will you work with dedication? Let's come to the New Testament and look at another person. We look at Peter. Peter was a great fisherman. And you will expect that a great fisherman will be successful at sea. But you go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, 1 to 11. And Peter had gone fishing the whole night and caught nothing. He comes a disappointed fisherman mending his nets. And then somebody comes and says, my friend, bring your boat. Let me sit in. So he gets into the boat and he says, go out a little bit. And he does. And this man stands and teaches the people. He preaches. He teaches the people. And when he had finished, he said, now go a little further and let your nets down. My friend, you don't know what you are talking about. The whole night. I worked the whole night. I couldn't catch a thing. Now you ask me, but because you say it, I will be obedient. I will do it. And Peter moved out into the deep and they cast their net. And they caught so much that they could virtually not pull it up. And when they brought it, there was so much fish. There was so much fish that they could not handle it. Then Peter said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Like Moses, Peter was seeing that he was unworthy. He couldn't be useful. But Jesus Christ said, you, I am picking you to be fisher of men. Now you not just catch fish, but you will catch men. Then Peter continued to walk with Jesus for three years. He was a dynamic man, aggressive man, active man, impulsive. But occasionally, Peter will suffer from some acts of weakness to the point where at the last day, Peter said, wherever you go, I will go with you. But finally, when Jesus told him that by the time the cock will crow three times tomorrow, you would have denied me three times. And Peter said, no way. Yet he did. Yet he did. And Peter was disappointed. But when Christ rose up from the dead, and he met Peter, 
He asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you three times. And then he asked him to turn the sheep. Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you love him? He's calling you to care and give attention to the lambs and the sheep. But that was not the end of Peter. The climax was that when Jesus was ascending, he told them to wait until they received power from on high. And they waited in prayer. They waited. And on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter came out. It was a festival. So people had come from all over the place to Jerusalem to worship. And they came in their numbers. And Peter gave a testimony of Jesus Christ and his saving grace. Now, nowadays we use microphones. We use microphones. We use microphones. In those days, there were no microphones. So you can imagine, how can Peter talk to about 10,000 people and they will all hear him? But they did. They heard him. And at the end of it, as many as 3,000 people accepted the Lord. And they did marvelous things. Following that, he became one of the greatest leaders. So he was considered as a noble pillar. Paul calls Peter a noble pillar in Galatians 2.9. So again, what are the key things we learn about Peter? Peter also responded to the call of Jesus Christ in a state of unworthiness. During the three years, as I've said, he was impulsive, energetic, dynamic, but sometimes displayed instability. But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he became one of the most powerful men working for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Moses and Peter were called. And Jesus Christ is calling us now. The thing said men, but we are all here. Who said women are not effective? All of us. He's calling us. And he's reminding us of the great commission. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. All authority. All authority is given to me. Go therefore. He's asking us to go and make disciples of all nations. And then he ends that he will be with us. He will equip us. He will empower us. He will help us. Shall we respond? Or shall we say we are weak? We cannot do it. My prayer is that we will respond. And then he will equip us to do the work that we may say yes. And if we do, he will empower us to move on. The next step we want to look at, after you have been called, what? We must receive some training. We must be trained. And I'm looking at a few things we know it not be complex. In simple ways, we can be trained. So what was Jesus' own style? Jesus would teach the whole crowd. He would speak to a large number of people. Initially, he used parables. Common things, which will explain more complex things. And sometimes, they did not understand. But afterwards, he would take his disciples indoors and ask them and explain and make it clear. So that was deeper teaching. When we bring it to our own situation, the Methodist Church, we have the group teaching or preaching when we have our sermons. 
and a monthly teaching service. This is group. We are here. It's only the last one that Sofo Fifi organized it slightly differently. He put a panel in front here, and then it became more of a discussion and sharing. Otherwise, we listen, and we don't know whether we have even heard or not. But how can we learn from even this group experience? My suggestion is that if we come and we take a few notes to see the points being raised, and we go home and search the Bible like the people of Berea did, we will learn a lot, even from the sermons and from the weekly, monthly teachings. The next is teaching in the small groups. And we have our Bible classes. We have a wealth of information in our weekly Bible lessons to guide us to learn. Unfortunately, since after the COVID, our attendance to class meetings has become a problem. We are not coming in our numbers as we used to be. So, the appeal here, if we must mobilize as men for the growth of the church, then we must prepare for our Bible classes more effectively and participate actively. Then, we will be shocked what we will learn and how we can apply these. The next is the lay preacher school. And I am happy to say that the last few years, our lay preacher school is doing so well. And people who have passed through are doing so well. And those who are here or at Opegono would have observed that on Good Friday, these people who were handling the messages were so great and so good. And we should encourage more people to study in that area and move on. Then we can have special programs for training. If we are going to have something, we can have a special program specifically training people and we must participate in such training so that we can be effective. So that we can be effective. Now, Jesus Christ's teaching did not end there. He believed in delegation. So he got to a point, he asked his disciples, one version says 72, another one says 70. Whether it was 72 or 70, it was an even number. So if they were going in twos, you would still not have a problem. It was not an odd number. So he sent them out to preach. And he empowered them that when you go out, cast out the demons and preach the kingdom news. Give it to them and go light because they will care for you. You don't have to carry all your things. Go light and they will care for you. And they did. And they were shocked when they came back to report the joy they were filled with. Now, in our own circuit, some program is going on. And for our nursing societies, especially for the new one, which is just starting to be created, Agrizana, they say they call it Penny. I don't know whether it is the Gold Coast Penny or what? But they call it penny. We are mobilizing to go there. Now, are you willing to participate in this so that you can be sent there? And in this, Jesus was teaching us two things. Delegate responsibility to other people behind you to do the work. Two, let's work as a team. So he sent them in twos. And they say that two is better than one. And as for three, it is wonderful. A cord of three cords, a, a twine of three cords 
cannot easily be broken. So we must be ready to participate in these programs. Now, it does not end there. These are teachings. How about mentorship? How about mentorship? When we take um, Acts of the Apostles, we see Paul picking Timothy. Timothy had mixed parents, Greek father, Jewish mother. But the parents, grandmother and mother, trained him as a young man. So apart from training ourselves, we have a responsibility to train our children at home. Because if we form in the bad rock, we need them to take over and to move on. So the mother and the grandmother trained this boy. And then Paul took him. And as he did travel, Paul continued to train him to a point when he could entrust him with responsibility. So Timothy was caring for churches. Timothy was doing a wonderful thing to such an extent that Paul advised him in Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for all believers in speech, in conduct, love, and faith. Timothy became so powerful that he was to be an example. Now, if I was a young man in this church, 30, an example to us, the plus, 80 plus, to the 70s and 60s, to the young and old, so that is what God needs us. If we must be mobilized, then we must be ready to have Timothy relationships with the young people who are coming so that we can move on. But the mentorship goes even to Paul himself. Paul said the people should copy him as a model, just as he himself copied Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was his mentor, and he says we should copy him. And he adds further, and this one I love, I love this one very much, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 to 9, concerning work. Some people think that if you are a Christian, then you don't work, you sit down and wait, and then the things will happen. I, I still work sometimes. And sometimes I go on inspection to Clago. And when I'm going on inspection to Clago, around 10 o'clock, it's mostly women. They are praying and praying. There's nothing wrong with praying. But who said you should pray at 10 o'clock in the morning when somebody is looking for kinky to buy? So Paul advises them. He says in 1 Thessalonians 3, 7 to 9, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow my example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. Yet we worked night and day so Paul is saying, we should work. Let's set an example in church, example at home, example in the office, that because we are Christians, we will work. And that will be a source of drawing other people to the church. I have two sections of reflection and I'll finish. The next one, the way this I stole from Sophopayin, Dr. Jacob W. French. At a sermon on the 7th of May, he preached on the way from John's Gospel 14, 1 to 14. And he said, at the Last Supper with his disciples, 
It was supposed to be a happy day. But on that day, things happened which created a problem. He said, Judas is carried. You are going to betray me. As for you, Peter, you would have denied me three times by tomorrow morning. That as for the rest of you disciples, you will all desert. There will be nobody. Now, if he is saying this to his closest friends, what hope do you have? So, he told them, do not let your hearts be troubled. I am going. And when I go, I would t I'm putting it not in the straight way it is written, but in a way we will all understand. I will come and take you to my son. Then Thomas, my friend, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So Jesus replied in our famous text, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And also for pain showed three ways in which this way becomes effective in our lives. The first one, he says, it is a statement of confession. It's a confessional way that as a believer, you are confirming that Jesus Christ is truly your Lord and your Savior and you get to the Father through him. And for that reason, it is only his teaching and doctrine that you will follow. You will not go and follow some other teaching and doctrine which will lead you astray because Jesus Christ is the way. Is the way. So as we follow him, we have to be careful the groups we belong to. We have to be careful the doctor because that is there are so many modern philosophies around. And if you are not careful, you will say you are intelligent and you will be swayed. So that's the confessional way. The second way, he said, is the transformational way. And that is our theme. Jesus transforms us to perform in a way that is better and more effective. So he transforms us from a certain situation to an extremely situation. So, 1 Peter 2, 1 gives some of the negative things that we should avoid. He says we should avoid malice, deceit, hypocrisy, and slander of every kind, and rather love our neighbor as ourselves. We should love and care for others. My last section is on love. So I will not dwell on this too much as we move on. He then said that this living, the Christ way, was demonstrated by Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas was at Antioch, and he was working with the Christians. And it got to a stage he saw that he needed help. So he went to Tarsus and invited Saul. Now, sometimes you think you can do it alone. They are showing us that in certain situations, you must invite other people to come and help to build us up so that we can be effective as members of the church. So he went and invited Paul. And for one year, as a team, they taught the people at Antioch. They mobilized the people. And they became so powerful, not only in their preaching, but in their way of life. So that when the people saw them, they saw them as people who lived like Christ. And therefore, given the nickname, Christian is a nickname. It's a nickname that we are. They demonstrated by their lives that they were living like Christ. And this is what is expected of us from the study, 
from the association, from the prayer, and so on, as we build up that teaching for one whole year, build them up to live like Christ. The final way he mentioned, he says, is the missionary way. If you have accepted Christ, then he sent you on a mission. You must witness, you must proclaim his word and give Stephen as an example. Stephen was one of the seven who were selected to share food. I mean, he was selected to share food because the Hellenist widows were not, when the people were sharing food, they gave the Jewish women more. And the Greek women were suffering. They were not getting. So they complained. So let's say, okay, let's select people to share the food so that we will concentrate on prayer and the work of God, the ministerial work. They share food. So they started sharing food. But when God calls you for a purpose, he wants to do a lot more out of you. So he built Stephen up. Later on, we'll see Philip. But today, we're only dealing with Stephen. And Stephen became so powerful that he started witnessing for Christ. And people who opposed him will argue. But his wisdom was so great that they couldn't stand him. So they took him to the Sanhedrin. Look at what this small, small boy is doing. And then his preaching was even stronger than the one in the street. So they didn't know what to do. And they said, Stephen should be stoned to death. So as they stoned him, the effect Christ had had on him, now he looked up and he saw the welcome voice for him. And therefore, he pleaded that those who were stoning him should be forgiven. Their sin should not be counted with their many other sins. So, through this following the way, it enables us to practice what we learn. It enables us to put into effect what we learn. Now, finally, Unless we do all this in love and humility, we cannot succeed. So Jesus Christ demonstrates that the love originates from God himself. So our famous verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This opportunity was being given to the whole world. It was not to people who were perfect. So as we go out, we shouldn't discriminate and think that somebody is not worthy of the message. Everybody is worthy and everybody can be saved. Everybody can be saved. He goes on and says that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5.8, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be perfect. While we were sinners, he died for us. So by grace, we are saved. So by grace, others will be saved. We don't set any yardsticks for them. And the humility in Christ is seen that he left his Godship and took the human nature and died for you and for me. So Paul says in the famous Philippians 2, especially verses 9 to 11, therefore God called him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then Christ charges us to love even as he has loved. He goes further to love even of our enemies, to feed them when they are hungry, to give them water to drink when they are thirsty. 
to care for our enemies. And the beauty is what he ends up with and which I tell the orientation class that everybody should learn to memory. Romans 8, 38 and 39. And I want to read that. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. And this is for matured Christians, for growing Christians, and for new converts. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the, word, uh, the, from the love of God. And so it is with this strength and assurance that we move in the task that we are being given. Just to conclude, four points we are being asked to follow in order to be able to live the life of Jesus Christ and form the bedrock. First of all is the call. And we must respond to the call with total commitment and dedication to serve, knowing that Christ Jesus will equip us and he is the source of our strength. Two, we should seek every opportunity to participate in teachings, training, and mentorship so that we can grow in the Lord. Three, we should seek to follow Jesus Christ as the way, as we confess him, as we live him, and as we witness the way. And finally, we should love in humility. We should serve in humility. And we will be surprised the impact we will make. May the good Lord touch and bless us so that it will be beneficial to all of us. Amen. 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 I'm standing in and I appreciate the speaker. I found a friend, oh, such a friend. He loved me, and I knew him. He would be with the courts of love and as he bound me to him not that I have I call my own I hold it for the giver and he is mine forever and forever Please kindly resume your seats. I will continue from this side with my work as the chairman for the occasion, assisting my MC. And um, or if you have your program, you would know that the topic that we have looked at, just to buttress, living the transformed life in Jesus Christ, men as bedrock or spiritual and physical development of the church. But I assembly will have a per day Ebisa. We have been treated to the background of the life and times of Professor De Graf Johnson, of whom this lecture, or for whom this lecture is named. We have also been challenged by the call of Moses and Peter as exemplary ones that we could also attest to or respond to. And you hear that in the conclusion, we have been also directing four key areas by which we can also respond in our time. 
I don't know whether Moses comes from uh, Takradi, I don't know. But, uh, but as for Peter, I know that he comes from Adanfo because he's a fisherman, you know. A, <laughs> but Moses, where does he come from? I know Peter is a fisherman, so he comes from Adanfo. That way, yeah, well, that's why, you know, that's fishing. <laughs> All right. Based on the program is Open Forum. Open Forum said that we can make contributions, ask questions. You've heard about PA, um, the Graf Johnson. Um, if maybe you want to ask what few this is. So please, the listen is now on this side. MC, please kindly control for it. Brothers and sisters, if you have a question, we would request kindly that you put up your hand. If you can't come forward, we'll bring the microphone to you. Question, contribution. It's been a wonderful exposition. I imagine there may be one or two clarifications, a comment or two that you want to, to bring up to enrich. It's an open forum now. We bring the mic to you or you kindly come to the front on the microphone. Okay. Good evening. Um, thank you for this A to Z of the lecture that you have delivered this evening. Um, when we came, we had a private conversation. And I said, if you can do it, then who? Who else can do it? And I'm sure we all agree. He understand it. But of late, there are certain um, occurrences in the Bible that previously I have taken literally. The recent example has to do with the ascension of Jesus Christ. Of four way cross, sorry. And indeed, from time immemorial, we have seen posters of Jesus hanging in the air and going. But yesterday, or was it was it Monday? Wednesday. No, Wednesday. Our uh, ascension day was yesterday, it was Wednesday. It's a special ascension day to Bishop Sir. This is Emmanuel Ascension Day. But we had some enlightenment from our superintendent minister. And at the end of it, we all realize that it is not to be taken literally. In the case of Peter, when Jesus entered Peter's boat and preached and all that, and then asked him to put his net again, and as you rightly said from the Bible, he caught a lot of fish. Kwala wop, sonyi wop, ni nabi wop. And Peter said, all night I have toiled and caught. Is it a literal translation or there is some, is it a literal thing that happened? 
or is there some uh, deeper message that this is illustrating? Please, can you clarify? Indeed, if not, I think you have a, a very rich panel to educate us on, on this particular issue. I know there's another one behind us. So I leave it to all of you to, to educate us on this as well. Thank you. Can, if there's another question um, on the request of the chairman, we can take that and then combine the responses. Okay, chairman, please. Um, I think there's somebody coming. Chairman. And just a moment, uh, Chairman, for the purpose of the production, if we could have the microphone this way, um, my attention is being drawn that for coverage, if we can put the microphone. All right. A bit closer. Yes. All right. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm um, listening to the lecture realize that you mentioned the vast or numerous achievements of Prof and how he was able to also do church work. I mean, spotless. <laughs> how can we, in this day and age, looking at everything that's going on, especially as young people coming up, who are also striving and aiming high to be like, the profs of our time, be able to balance all that we are doing with family life, church, work, and social life, based on the lecture you gave. Thank you very much. Uh, Papa is taking notes. We take that these are the two contributions we would like to thank uh, uh, metaphysical philosopher <laughs> for, for creating a metaphysics of philosophy of uh, fishing for you. <laughs> he wants to know whether there is something more about that and then again how to balance that. So Papa, you, you may sit here, sir. You may sit here. The the first one, I have powerful ministers by me. So I, I am pleading that they take it up because they have greater knowledge than I am likely to have. But on Alfred's question, how can we combine our true Christianity? with our work and social life and all. Now, combining it to me is a way of living your Christian life. Assuming that you work in a place, there is a young man who works for me and maintains a garden at London Restaurant. And for some weeks, he doesn't go to work on Thursday. So they complained. And the message we received that now he has found some church and he has all night, Wednesday night. Therefore, the following day, he cannot go to work. I think God doesn't want us to pray like that. God wants us to pray to be enabled to do what we have been assigned more effectively. Because if you cannot perform the task, like when you were at the bank, Fifi, if you prayed so much so that you couldn't go to Eco Bank, how can the system be managed? So there must be a clear balance. Yes, social life, our normal work, our family work, and so on. And if you cannot 
combine that, then you can really not serve because I, I cannot see what is taking you so much of your time that you cannot carry out the normal work that you have been trained to carry out. Because it's, to me, it's a way of testimony. You are in a working place, say you are an engineer, and the work is being done haphazardly. And because you say you were busy with Christ, you didn't check the work, you didn't check the standards, you didn't check the specifications, and shoddy work is done, a year or so later, the road fails. You think you have served God, you have not. So we must truly balance the work we are trained to do and the other activities we carry out as believers. That, that what I believe very strongly in it. Fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, the Bible was written for a certain situation. And we have come a long way this way and are trying to relive what has been written. The historicity of what transpired is not contested that Jesus with his disciples, I mean, went to disciples and said everything that he said. And they responded, we have toiled all night, we have had nothing. And then he comes and says, put it here. It's perfect. But the secondary understanding is how we live that kind of life, appreciating the Lordship of Jesus Christ, appreciating that he is God and that he can direct us to, to do this. And once we are obedient to his word, we achieve. The point is that when the net was cast and the fact that they could not even pull it is an indication that when we evangelize and do it well, it will be such that we will be surprised at the numbers that, that will come our way. But of course, again, in the net you had all sorts of fish indicating to us that the church in which we find ourselves, which is the net kind of, has all sorts of people. There are the good ones, there are the bad ones, there are the tall ones, there are the short ones, and there's everybody within it. So it is a case of God helping us to understand who we are and who our neighbors are and who constitutes the church. All those of us who come into the chapel, which is the church, are not the same. Some are uh, Eban, some are Wawenyan, some are Ibwe and so on and so forth. But we all make the church. That is how we should understand it. So that we don't belittle anyone. We don't look down on anyone. We are differently composed. And it is that different composition that makes us who we are. That again helps us to understand who this God is. I always think and say that heaven will be a nice place to be because everybody will be accepted once you live that life and you live it well. Ghanaians will go to the throne of grace with our Ghanaianess. Nigerians will do the same. South Africans will do the same. And everybody will do that. And so it will be a commemorate of everyone all in the presence of, of God serving him. That is how and what the church is. Thank you very much. We would like to thank the, the bishop. Uh, we will move on with the program. Please appreciate yourself also. <laughs> for, and we ask, we thank God for the MC will lead us on. Thank you very much, Bishop.
Brothers and sisters, with the permission of the chair and bishop, sir, we want to, before we continue, recognize the family of our late Professor David Graf Johnson, who are here, um, led by Dr. Joseph W. De Graf Johnson, says, may you please rise for us to recognize you. Shall we please? We are grateful for the honor done us in accepting for us to have this lecture. Shall we, shall we keep it up for them? Kind permission, if you could come forward with your kind permission, please. Shall we please recognize them as they come forward? Thank you very much. Uh, we, we thank you for the opportunity, giving us the, the go ahead um, to, to be able to do this. Brothers and sisters, we move on uh, in the interest of time. On our programs, we see a plea for funds and offertory. We want to combine both, and it's for a very good purpose. As part of the men's week, we are mobilizing resources for the Methodist Retreat Center in Kwada, so uh, a very important part of mobilizing uh, men resources for the work of God. And so we would um, ask for the ashes to lead us uh, in this time of offertory. And may I request that uh, as we head our uh, speaker, Jesus ask them to launch into the deep. Uh, th this is a, a horizontal deep. May I request that we go deeper uh, to, to raise funds for the work of God, uh, which is ongoing. So um, the organist and the, the talent team will lead us. We'll come from the back uh, under the guidance of the ushers. Thank you. Yes, what I'm a shadow. Papa more born in moon. Nana name a Jeffo. The best if you are me done. No, then you know. May I yes, what I was in you now. And you'll be no shadow. Yes, what I'm a shadow. Papa more born in moon. Nana name a Jeffo. The best if you are me done, no. Then you know, when you are so, me what you know. When you are so, my friend, I'm coming at the end. When you are so, my friend, I'm coming at the end. When you are so, my friend, I'm coming at the end. When you are so, my friend, I'm coming at the end. Messia is who I'm a quemwa. Come here, Messia is who I'm a quemwa. Come here, Messia is who I'm a quemwa. Come here, Messia is who I'm a quemwa. Come here. So good, Lord, you so good, Lord, you are kind, Lord, you are wonderful, my Lord, you are Lord, you are so good, Lord, you so good, you so good, you are kind, Lord, you are wonderful. Oh, 
Please let us pray. Father, once again, we recognize that all gifts and all good gifts comes from you. We thank you for the gift of our lives. We thank you for the gift of Papa the Graf Johnson. And we thank you above all the gifts of our Lord Jesus Christ, bringing us all together. You loving us and giving yourself for us. Father, we respond to this gift, rendering ourselves to you and asking that let your grace fall on us and make us a blessing to our generation and others after us. And above all, our gifting in money for the service of the kingdom, we pray that you bless these offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. Please kindly resume your seats. Well, the bishop is going to speak, so I don't want him to turn his back to the bishop. And that's why, for those of you who do know, this is our landlord. You know, <laughs> if you are a stranger here, this is our landlord. Uh, he had the permission of the bishop to be absent because he also had to carry on ministry as a, in another setting uh, to help some of our people who want to understand a little bit more of the Bible and theology at the Trinity Theological Seminary. So he has to rush from that place to come to join us. Friends, uh, if uh, we were in the charismatic community, so-called charismatic community, because I use the word so-called because to say charismatic church is a tautology because the church is already charismatic. Uh, don't be confused. <laughs> they would have said the papa of the house. <laughs> But we have amongst us somebody who I was watching when the speaker was speaking about Papa. And he was taking notes because he's one of the foremost church historians that we have. At the time that we were studying at the seminary, we knew about people like uh, Dr. Agbeti, who was teaching us church history. And Papa talked about mentorship, you know, so put on so on, culture, this thing. And Dr. Agbeti passed on a little, not too long ago. Today, in the Methodist Church Ghana, when we are talking about church historians, okay? who is also leading us in a lot of your know, church history has to do also with the way we worship, how we worship, the history of worship, you know, and so forth and so on. And the life and ministry of the church in terms of our liturgical practices. And so he also doubles as the chairman of the liturgy committee. Everything you are seeing on with these uh, readings and so forth and so forth. That of 2024, right, he has even posted it to us already. So as we are speaking now, he has posted to us already, we are beginning to work on the 2024 one, which he has uh, recruited this gentleman <laughs> and myself to be on that team. <laughs> so that is also our chairman, and he's also the, you know, the chairman for the general directorate for ministries that looks at all the things that we do in the church. These are several things that he also does. You only know him as the bishop of the northern Accra diocese, but I'm telling you the other things that he's also involved in, in the church. Please, let's welcome our foremost church historian and our bishop, the right reverend professor Joseph Manasi Yakwa Edusa Eusin. You normally welcome the bishop by standing. Thank you. Please sit. Uh, one could, has it? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Thank you very much for the reception. Th thank you very much. Bishop, sir, your people are ready to listen. Thank you, my brother. Osofupong, 
Samuel Kofi or Sabote. Fathers and mothers, um, we thank God for the rendition. Thank God for what um, Papa Abisam has told us. And we are very, very grateful. Um, helping us to relive um, the life of uh, Prof. DeGraff Johnson. Um, when I was asked to be a guest, I looked at the theme, living the transformed life in Jesus Christ, men as bedrock for spiritual and physical growth of the church. So standing in the existing protocol, um, let me begin uh, wishing all of us well, and um, the people called Methodist invited guests assembled here to listen to Papa Abisam. Mr. Chairman, scripture affirms the place of fathers as heads of the home, hence the spiritual and physical growers of the family and by extension the society. Uh, given its significance, the role of fathers as builders of homes and society cannot be pushed to the periphery. Mr. Chairman, in Israel, men as heads of the home responsible for leading prayers and benedictions at domestic worship services were in addition to be responsible for the religious education of the younger members of the family. So as a spiritual head of the home, as we read from Ephesians 5, men must play the teaching role effectively to the admiration of all. And as we listened to Papa Abisam, that came out clearly as a life lived by Prof. Teaching and helping people to understand what life is all about, what faith is all about. Moreover, Mr. Chairman, as the home is the proper atmosphere where convictions gained at school can continue to flourish. Homes led by fathers must radically transform and exert the proper spiritual influence on the child. Christian homes must live lives controlled by the nature of Christ that is attainable by the renewal of the mind. That is why fathers are encouraged to labor on and not relent in our attempts to live the transformed life in Jesus Christ. Fathers as role models for the family to emulate. And Papa Abisam hinted that point also. Now, given our motto, for Christ we live, understood in the present continuous tense, we, the men of the church and home, must persevere despite the odds. Papa Ab Abisam narrating the story, the life history of Prof, reminded us that this great man, illustrious son of the church and the nation, was born into a Christian home and Christian tradition becoming a Christian par excellence himself, Professor DeGraff Johnson understands what we have just mentioned, the role of fathers, the role of Christians, and how excellence must be injected into the fabric of humanity, beginning with the home. And, and Ankara Bissam mentioned that also, how Prof tried as much as possible to encourage his children and his home to show excellence. A nation or an institution that does not honor its people is not worth dying or living for. It's a saying we are all too familiar with. 
And as we honor uh, Prof. Grab Johnson, an illustrious son of the child and nation, someone whose life is worth emulating, Prof. Johnson was a man blessed with, with large capacity. He mentioned it. He had uncommon abilities and gifts. With natural eloquence, easy flowing expression, lively apprehension, quick discernment, strong memory, penetrating genius, clear thought, and spiritually gifted. Professor DeGraff Johnson, we heard, devoted his entire life to Christ to the point that he, he was a founding member, to the point that he was a founding member of church, founding member of men's fellowship, and almost first in so many of the things that he, he did. And therefore, indicates to us how he lived a life of self-denial, a life of sacrifice, devotion to duty, and lived before the presence of Christ. The life of such people as Prof. Johnson, Digab Johnson, helps us to appreciate how our church, and again, it was hinted, how our church grows warmer through fellowship. He mentioned it when, when issues come. He will, he will constructively and positively crit criticize, see, so, so that you wouldn't feel unwanted you still find yourself in the warm relationship. So how, how our church grows uh, warmer through fellowship. Prof. Johnson made us to understand how our church grows deeper through discipleship by his teaching prowess. How our church grows stronger through worship. He's always, he was always here at the back over there, old as he, he, he was how our church grows broader through ministry and larger through evangelism. Mr. Chairman, effective and efficient evangelism enjoins us to appreciate the place of the native language in our witness as a distinctive mark of our Christianity. So for us, God speaks in fancy. For us, God speaks ga. He speaks ever. He speaks more in fancy, ga and ever, and very little English. Once we understand it like that, we will appreciate our own mother tongue and live by it. Mr. Chairman, the lecture and the lecturer has helped us to relive the enviable, humble life of Professor DeGraff Johnson as we request God to inject those characteristics of Prof into us in our attempt to live the transformed life of Jesus Christ. As we listened with rapt attention, enjoying the lecture, Mr. Chairman, my wish is that we will be forcefully enjoined to appreciate our role as men and women of the society called, and again, Uncle Abisam, he emphasized, called, 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 called to spiritually and physically grow the society. My final point is that, Mr. Chairman, when God calls, as Mr. Habisam reiterated, when God calls, he does not only see who and what you are, but when God calls, he also sees who and what you can become. He doesn't see only who you are today, but he also sees who and what you can become tomorrow. When God called Prof so many years back, he knew what he was going to be in the future. Mr. Abisam's point is that 
if God has called us, are we prepared? That's what he asked. Are we prepared to be used for God and uh, for what God has blessed us with to be unearthed in us? So let us come at this and uh, as, as we go, remember what transformational life we must live. Remember whose lecture we have come to listen to and remember what um, insights we may gain from this. Our church is blessed. Blessed with sons and daughters whose lives are worthy of emulation. One of them is Professor DeGrab Johnson. May he find continued rest in the bosom of our maker. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, Bishop, sir. Um, Bishop Chairman, we may take your remark now, please. Your closing remarks. Yeah. Actually, the closing remarks is that we have closed. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that not the remarks? <laughs> That's a shorter one. <laughs> Friends, let me just begin with where Bishop started. I said I have the penchant for doing things informally, but when my bishop is around, I normally behave properly. <laughs> the bishop of the diocese, standing on the already established protocols, you ended up by mentioning something about the core. And one thing I have learned, because I just completed a number of studies, and as you heard in my little profile, leadership is something I eat and drink. And I have discovered that, Bishop, sir, that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. So you can write it down if you, you think it is okay. God does not call the what? He qualifies the what? The called. We are sure that together we can affirm that the night has not been wasted. If you believe that, put your hands together for the Lord. It was Henry Wordsworth, Longfellow, who wrote, and I quote, Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. We believe that the speaker, Papa Abis, Sam Abe, I normally call him Abe Sam, I don't know why, but Sam Abe. <laughs> Abe Sam. Hmm. That's the correct one. <laughs> Supplemented by what we just heard from the bishop, our foremost historian, the Methodist Church Ghana, has stimulated our minds as men in particular and Christians in general. Are you rethinking your role in church and beyond the church, the society as a Christian man, as you listen to the theme that has just been exposed to us, living the transformed life in Jesus Christ, men as bedrock of spiritual and physical development of the church. And I have added also the society. What have you learned from the lecture that challenges your own life? And what specific actions do you intend to take as a result of this? In the Judeo-Christian Bible, we read that God's creation culminated in the creation of Adam, which in the Hebrew is Ish, who was given responsibility or role to work the land 
that is to be in charge of God's other creations, Genesis 2.15. This responsibility was to later include managing Adama, which is Isha, the male female, the female man. We are doing theology. <laughs> so both Bishop and um, Papa Abisam said, this lecture is for the men, but it also includes the what? The, the women. So women are the female man. So Ish and Isha, Adam and Adama, who was to serve as a helper to Adam, the Ish. The fall of Adam, the Ish, led to a distortion of this mandate in Genesis 3, 1, 50, one following, and the order of things as originally planned by God. Thankfully, by the message of this, this same God, a second Adam, Jesus the Christ, came to restore humanity, Adam as the ish, back to the first state. And this is what we have just studied in Romans chapter 5, 12 to 21, which has the details. And Papa alluded to that when he said that Jesus Christ comes to make the difference in the life of the Adam, the fallen man. To every transport man now, we hear the exhortation of Paul to Pastor Titus to the Christian community. And I'm quoting Titus 2 too. Teach the older men. Teaching came out in the presentation. Teach the older men to be one, temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Let me repeat that. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and endurance. This was a charge of Paul to Titus, Pastor Titus to the Christian community. We pray that this will be the template to which all Christian men will set their standards in the Christian community as we all seek to live a transformed life in Jesus Christ as his disciples. Let us rise from this event Resolve that from orthodoxy. Don't be confused. I addressed my men's fellowship in preparation for the men's week, the previous week, and I used these two words and they were confused. Don't be confused. Orthodoxy means right doctrine. And I'm saying let us rise from this event, resolve that from orthodoxy, the right doctrine that we have, we shall move on to autopasis. Don't be confused. In Methodist Church, you have to learn big words. Say amen to that. That is right duty. It is only in this way we can be men of significance. Bishop, I am learning throughout this men's week under the teaching of Professor Sefo Kampu Kantaka that success without significance is failure. May you not be remembered only as a successful man, but a man and person of significance. Did I hear amen to that? We are here not because Professor DeGrab Johnson was successful in life, but because he made a significant what? Impact. For Christ, for Christ, may it be so, indeed. Listen, Mark, watch my lips. For Christ, for Christ, may it be so, indeed. Do you, are you getting the difference? May not be it so, indeed. May it be so, what? In the war, or you My mouth has fallen down. Thank you.
Shall we do it again for our chairman? Let's, let's recognize him. Thank you very much, Bishop. We are wrapping up. And we will have just two things to go, the benediction and then a vote of thanks. The key takeaway for me, God calls me not only for who I am, but what I can become. So how do I avail myself? Prof is a huge learning book and path for most of us. And we'll walk away very, very inspired. We want to put ourselves for everybody who is here, even before we have the vote of thanks, please. Let's, let's appreciate each other. To do that formally, we'll call our brother, Elvis Blanson, who is the chairman for our N um, KDM branch, Men's Fashion KDM. Brother, thank you very much. Shall we welcome him? <laughs> to give us a vote of thanks, then we'll have the benediction from the high table. Brothers, for Christ, for Christ, and for Christ, Emmanuel. Brothers, um, it gives me great pleasure to be elected to give the vote of thanks. First of all, we thank the God Almighty for making it possible for all of us to gather here, especially giving us a good weather to come and listen to the first Professor K. E. De Graf Johnson Memorial Lectures. God, we give you the glory. Secondly, we we'll give a thanks to our very special guest, Right Reverend Professor Joseph M. Y. Dusayasin, our Bishop of the Northern Accra Diocese. Papa, we say thank you. Thank you so much for coming. We are very grateful to our Chairman, Right Reverend Samuel Kofi Usabute, past Bishop of Accra Diocese. Papa, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Correction noted. <laughs> thank you. We also would like to thank the um, host minister. Thank you so much, very Reverend Dr. Joseph French. Thank you very much, sir. We are very grateful that you came, <laughs> gracing the occasion. We also would like to thank the organizers and the planning committee of this very special program you ensure that this program takes place, and indeed it has taken place. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank our speaker, Brother Kwesi Abesam. He digested the, the topic indeed. Let's give him a round of applause. He's done so, so, so well, and we thank you. Again, we'd like to thank everybody, all of us, coming here to make the program a success. Thank you so much. May the good Lord, may the good Lord take us back home safely. Uh, we are also not forgetting the family of the late Professor K. E. D. Graf Johnson, who are here present. Thank you so much that you came and made the program a success. May the good Lord takes all of us home and give us tomorrow, and we'll all rise up and give him the glory. Thank you so much for coming. God bless us all. For Christ, for Christ, um, we are at the end of the lecture. And we would like to end this session with a special prayer 
and the benediction to be given by the bishop. But the prayer will be a prayer for the family members who are here, representing the entire family. As we heard from the speaker, he was born into a family, nurtured not only by the church, but the family also. Saved the family, supported by the family, and in pattern, he has left us the family. We'll keep praying with them and then also share moments with them. So we'll be singing the Methodist hymn book number 896, the hymn number 896, and then we, as we sing, we will humbly ask representatives of the family to be uh, a little bit in the front so that together we hold them in prayer uh, and then end with a benediction. So the hymn is uh, 893, sorry, 896 of the Methodist hymn book. Now praise we great and famous men. 896. Now praise we great and famous men. Please let us kindly stand and do it. The says stands out. In peace, your sacred ashes rest, fulfilled their days and ever. They bless the earth and they are blessed. we sing the last stanza, we continue standing and the prayers will be said for the family and uh, benediction by the bishop. So praise we great and famous men, their father's name the history. Praise the Lord who now was then reveals in man his glory. Shall we please bow down our heads and pray. Father God, we cannot thank you enough for all that you have done 
for us, people who didn't deserve to be loved, but because of your love, your mercy. Love and mercy that angels do not even understand. As a result, Methodist in 371, stanza 2, asking angels not to disturb themselves, their minds to understand, because they would not. It's all mercy. It is mercy all. Father, we thank you. We thank you that people like us, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, came to die, to give us life, that we might have life and have it in abundance. We thank you. We thank you for our forebears, our mothers and our fathers, through whom you have brought us into the world. As we do this, especially remembering the family of Professor DeGrab Johnson. We thank you for the parents who brought them forth. We thank you for the nature they received at their hands. We thank you for all the spiritual benedictions by which cause we are what we are today. Thank you for taking them through everything that you took them through and placing them where you have placed them. A family that you blessed with ministers, a family that you blessed with doctors, with engineers, with people, with teachers, with good Christians, people whose lives will be worthy of emulation. We thank you. And we thank you that in church, they lived that life as a result of which this society and circuit is honoring one such, Professor DeGraff Johnson. We pray that all of them that you have called to yourself will find rest in your bosom. That when our times are up, we will also be counted worthy to join them singing hallelujah unto your name and serving you. Father, our prayer is that all the good things that he did that you blessed him with will be communicated also to our lives. That we will take strides in what they, they, they left. We will, we will live that kind of life, the transformed life, so that we can become true descendants, true family members of people like these. And we will never forget to return thanks unto your holy name. We pray that you bless the family. Bless all their endeavors, their marriages, their work, bringing up of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and everything that they do. And by extension to the church, by extension to the nation. So that as we depart tonight, we are assured that we are not departing from your presence because that presence is always with your people. Let that presence continue to be with us. As we retire into our beds, give us sound sleep. Wake us up tomorrow morning renewed in strength to continue serving you. And we will continue to give our lives to you to use as you deem fit. Thank you for hearing us because we have done this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Now the benediction. Go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Help the weak. Support the faint-hearted. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with all of us now and always. Amen. Amen. No longer mind.
take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Irazi, new woman, new son, Irazi, woman, I'm using Remashe, my many Amen. Mr. Romian, it's For Christ. For Christ. So, by the grace of God, we have come to the end of today's program. We continue tomorrow, and it will be 